uh, the temple was for worship, not business, commerce, or trade. And this is what got Jesus so revved up. It was the misuse of the temple grounds. It was the distraction that this business caused for somebody who was a sincere worshiper of Yahweh or someone who was just uh, pursuing more knowledge uh, of Yahweh. He was just upset about this. It was revved up. In fact, notice that Jesus says this. He says, my father. Now, we're so used to reading that uh, in the scriptures. We, that doesn't even register on us as a, as a very important statement. We know that the father is Jesus, his father. He says this all the time. But to the Jew and to the person that's hearing him say this, they would hear two things. There was an indication of two main things here. God the Father was the authority behind Jesus' actions. In fact, when we get down to verse 18, we're going to see that that's exactly what the Jews assume. And they're basically asking, they're not asking what authority. They're saying, if you're claiming divine authority, show us a sign. That's going to be the heart of their question when we get down to verse 18. But the second thing is, is they are going to view Jesus saying, my father, because no Jew in this day would identify God as their personal God. They would talk about him in distant terms. We serve the great one. We serve the mighty one. They, and, and, and you know, they wouldn't even fill in the syllables of his name, right? They would use his name in consonantal form so that they wouldn't blaspheme. They were very careful. And Jesus just made this personal. And to the Jew, how would they view that? Well, you got to see it for yourself. We'll get there in a, in a few weeks. Um, but John chapter 5, verse 17, another interaction uh, with Jewish religious people. Jesus answered them, my father, there's that phrase again, has been working until now, and I have been working. Then notice their response to that statement. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. See, that was their perspective when they heard that. So when Jesus says, don't make my father's house a house of merchandise, they're like, what? What did he just say? (laughs) Did he just say my father? That means that he's claiming divine authority and he's actually putting himself on equal par with God. Nobody did that. Nobody did that in Jewish culture. And so they're concerned. But before we get to the question of verse 18, John actually provides a little editorial comment for us. And he does this oftentimes. Sometimes he does a flashback. This time he's kind of giving us insight into the present. And in that moment, it says in verse 17 that the disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Again, why would this have come to mind here? Well, they, they saw his actions. They heard his comments. And for some reason, this Old Testament verse clicked in their thinking. And, and we'll talk about this in a second, um, but it was basically quoting a Psalm of David who also had a passion for God's house. So, so Jesus loved the temple, what it rep- represented, God's presence among the people, opportunities for all men to come and learn about him. He loved what that represented. That's what it was designed to do. Jerusalem was to be a city on a hill, a light that was not to be covered, right? And that's the, the whole goal of the city of Jerusalem. And then I, I love this phrase. I love the way that David writes this in Psalm 69, 9. But here he brings it out. It's eaten me up. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. And I, it's a very emphatic word. In fact, in the Greek, there's a preposition, kata, that's slapped on the front to intensify this action. The word itself means to eat, to swallow, to devour, to consume. You know, contrast a teenage girl and how she eats barbecue and a teenage boy and how he eats barbecue. And you'll see the contrast. The boys are usually the kata, you know, they're devouring it, man. It's like, wait a minute, dude, breathe and chew and before you swallow, you know. And and that's kind of the idea here, but it shows the passion. This is how Jesus' zeal for the house of God is described. It's his passion that's being brought out here. I mentioned earlier, it's taken from a Psalm of David. We know David had a strong zeal for the house of God. He wanted to build him a a, a permanent structure to honor his name. But God didn't give him that that, uh, gift. He gave it to his son, Solomon. But what David is recording in, in, in Psalm 69 is this zeal for God's house, which brought reproach and criticism of him. People criticized him for that. 
People reproached him for that. You can see that. I think it's the very next verse in Psalm 69. Jesus' zeal for the house is going to be criticized here, and later it's going to cost him his life. So you can see that connection that the disciples are making to this verse. There's a, a person zealous for the house of God, and then there's a negative reaction to the, the one who's zealous. And, and so you see the connection between David and obviously his descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in verse 18, we finally get to the response of the Jewish leaders. By the way, no, let's read this. Let me just make a comment. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And, and you'll notice John throughout the book, he's going to refer to the Jewish leaders oftentimes as the Jews. It's kind of important to know contextually because otherwise you're going to think the Jewish people are involved in this here. And I believe it's the Jewish religious leaders. This is who he's talking about when he says, the Jews answered him and said, what sign do you show us since you do these things? And this is because Jesus referenced his father. This is because Jesus referenced that, that his father, he was claiming the father's authority for this temple cleansing. And they said, okay, basically prove it. Show us something divine then. If God the Father gave the authority, we want to see a divine sign or miracle. And they wanted to confirm that he was a legitimate messenger of God. Now, it's, what's really fascinating to me is they're just like the contingent that was sent to John the Baptist in chapter 1, if you remember that. They weren't really concerned about John's message. The, they weren't really concerned if what he was saying was true. The only thing they were concerned about is, do you have authority to tell me that I'm wrong? And if you don't, I'm not listening to you. It's the same approach to Jesus. If you don't show us what we want to see to prove your authority, then we can just disregard you. And I think that's why the animal sellers and the money changers ended up back in the temple complex. And that's why Jesus has to clear it again in three years. They don't, Jesus doesn't give them the sign that they're looking for. They wanted some, you know, razzle dazzle right there in the temple complex that Jesus could prove. Um, that he was uh, of divine origin, had divine authority. Jesus isn't going to get that to them. He's going to point to a sign that will happen in three years from now. And they say, well, he doesn't have authority. We're not going to listen to this guy. Get the animal sellers back in there. Get those money changers back. And that was their attitude here. And so we're going to see who did they, really their attitude is, who do you think you are correcting us? Not, are what we're doing is, wrong? is what we're doing wrong? Should we reconsider what we're doing? None of that. It's like, I'm not going to listen to you until you can prove you're worth listening to. Okay, you don't have the authority? Go back. Guys, go right back in. Start doing what you did. That's kind of their attitude. Now, the Jews were known for wanting to see a sign. You know, um, many times they wouldn't unless they saw a sign. Jesus kind of voices that frustration in chapter 4 of John when we get there. Um, but 1 Corinthians one twenty two, even later, Paul says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. So this was kind of a known fact of Jewish people in that day. Uh, we also see that Jesus said to them, destroy this temple, uh, and in three days I will raise it up. And of the many signs that Messiah did, you know, John selected seven to convince us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was always interesting when Jesus would give a sign to uh, a, a Jewish religious contingent, or he, um, in Matthew 12, he gives the same exact sign. We'll talk about that in a second. When the, when the Jewish religious leaders have rejected him officially, he always points to the sign of the resurrection. He always points to the granddaddy of them all. That, that's the sign. It's cool that he turned water to wine. It is cool that he gives lepers clean skin. It is cool that he gives sight to the blind, those who are born blind. It is cool that he gives hearing to those who have never heard. It is even cool that as he's walking along, this lady dives for his tassel and she gets healed. That's all cool. But that ain't nothing compared to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is how he sets that sign up all throughout his life. That is to be the convincing proof. And that's why when we preach the gospel, we want to communicate the resurrection. You know, the, the good news, in our culture too, if you, if you only have an opportunity to preach his death, most people know that he raised. And, and, and if you preach his resurrection, that implies that he died. But in terms of having the opportunity, we want to communicate that because that is the miracle of all miracles that God performed to convince people that they can trust in Jesus Christ, that they can entrust their eternal destiny to him because God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. 
And so he points them to this future resurrection. In fact, uh, this was the sign of the prophet Jonah, which is three days, three nights in the belly of the fish. What's really fascinating, when you jump down to verse 23, it says that he's going to do a lot of signs at this Passover feast. He's just not going to give these Jewish religious leaders the razzle-dazzle they're looking for in this moment. He is going to do a lot of signs. In fact, these signs are going to be so convincing that one of the members of that Jewish leadership team is going to seek Jesus out in John chapter 3. That's Nicodemus. And remember what he's going to say in verse 2. Rabbi, we know that your teacher come from God. How do you know that, Nicodemus? For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. See, the signs were still convincing had they been looking. But he wasn't going to do this razzle-dazzle sign that they were looking for in this moment. In fact, it's this very quote here at the beginning of his ministry that's going to be misused against him in trial. Uh, years later, and also why he's hanging on the cross. At trial, this fellow said, Matthew 26, 61, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Now look at the wording in John and tell me if Jesus said that. He's not, he's not talking about destroying that temple. And he's not even saying he's going to destroy a temple. In fact, the word that he uses in John um, 2, 19, it's second person. You destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Not I'll destroy it. And this is what he's being accused of at his trial. When he's on the cross, Matthew 27, 40, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So you can see how Jesus remained on their radar after this event. This is still circulating in their mind. Three years later is as an accusation against him. And you know what's ironic about this is his comment wasn't even a threat against the Jewish temple. It wasn't a threat against Judaism as a whole. It was rather a sign given for his resurrection, which should have been enough to convince them that he was the Messiah. When he starts talking about this sign, why? And this is why it's so important to understand this and make this connection. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. This is where Paul defines the gospel that he preached. He says this, for I delivered first to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Notice that next phrase, according to the scripture. That means Jesus' death was prophesied in the Old Testament. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That means his resurrection was prophesied in the Old Testament. Who should have known these prophecies about the Messiah's resurrection? The Jewish leaders. This was a sign for them, studied, able, learned men that should have known that the Messiah was going to resurrect, and they missed the boat. What are a couple of verses? Well, Psalm 16, 9 through 10, a passage that the uh, apostles used often in Acts to prove that the Messiah would raise again, that it was prophesied about in the Old Testament. It says, therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. In other words, his body would not even decay. He would be raised so quickly within three days. Isaiah 53, 10 through 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, death, he shall see his seed. How's he going to see his seed if he just died? Resurrection. He shall prolong his days. How do you prolong your days when you're dead? resurrection. That's how you do it. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and he shall see the labor of his soul. How do you see the labor of your soul? How do you see the benefit of what you did in your death unless you raise from the dead? This is what was prophesied about in the Old Testament. And guess what? The Jewish leaders clearly misunderstood him. And, and we see that um, in their question. Now, some, and we'll kind of hit that in verse 20 here. Some may have asked, why was Jesus not more cooperative? Why didn't he just give them a sign? He could have just, right? He could have convinced the whole nation right here if he would have just acquiesced to what they did. But we know better. The timing wasn't right for a dramatic sign. Clearly, that's why he didn't do it. The father did not clear him to do something like that. And because his hour had not yet come. Also, there's something to be said about his audience at this point not being prepared to receive it. Jesus knew all of these things. So how did they respond to him? Well, they misunderstood him. They basically thought he was crazy. Look at their response in verse 20. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. 
They're thinking Jesus is talking about the temple building now. He switches words. And again, as I mentioned, this was really Herod's temple. It was a renovation of Zerubbabel's temple. He didn't build this from the ground up. These were all the remodeling. And history tells us the reconstruction, remodeling of the temple, like when it began. So we can just start the stopwatch and we can take Jesus's first temple cleansing to about 30 AD. That gives us a a great time frame. frame. Ironically, the renovation and remodeling went on for another 33 years after 30 AD, after this event. Um, And what's really ironic is the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, seven years after it was completed. Really, really terrible. And and they said, you'll raise it up in three days. The Greek words here are emphatic. Really? You're kidding me? You are, I mean, are you serious? It's really kind of an obnoxious, emphatic uh, kind of reply to him. Let's finish up verses 21 through 22. But he was speaking of the...